it was very frightening. You know, you never thought something was going to happen to you or somebody you know in that type of community. I just burst into tears because it all came back. It's just stuck with me that after all this time, they didn't know what had happened. This case is solvable. Here we are 34 years later. I do not suspect that this case or Tara's disappearance will go unanswered for 36 years. Tara's headlines would monopolize the media for the next 10 years. But there was no Tara, ever. On February 28th, 1969, David and Patty Calico welcomed Tara Lee Calico into the world. Tara was born in New Mexico, where she first found her love of the great outdoors. Her parents divorced when she was still a child, and Tara stayed with her mother. Patty moved on to her second husband, John Dole, and they relocated to Bellin, another New Mexico suburb in Valencia County. Tara and her siblings, Michelle and Chris, loved their small town, and the primarily Catholic and Christian community was very friendly. Their town was often described as small town America, where everyone knows everyone, everyone looks after everyone, and no one is outside the realms of safety. That is, until Tara Calico. Tara's adventurous nature was a perfect pairing for the town of Bellin, with its ranches, wide open spaces, and landscape conducive for exploring. Tara grew up into her adolescence without a hitch. She was a beloved schoolmate to everyone in her high school. People genuinely liked her, including teachers who saw her as an athletic yet brilliant woman with an innate kindness not often seen in people her age. Tara was very active since she could stand on her own two feet. She'd been into various sports and athletic activities, especially outdoor ones. She'd been a part of peewee and cheerleading. Aside from that, she also played softball, was a ski club member, and loved playing tennis, especially with her boyfriend. When Melinda Escabel was just a new girl in school, she joined the marching band where she met Tara. She was sitting alone, and Tara approached her and invited her to join her circle. This was a memory that Melinda would cherish for the rest of her life. Aside from her athletic prowess, her friends and family also noticed her sense of responsibility and knack for extreme organization. After high school, Tara decided to take up psychology in college. It was a field that had always fascinated her. She chose to attend the University of New Mexico in Valencia with Melinda. Around this time, she also started dating a former high school classmate, Jack Cole, the high school football team captain. He was her tennis partner and was active enough to participate in Tara's outdoor enthusiast lifestyle. Soon, she got a job as a bank teller in town to make extra money. She was motivated and hardworking with a bright future ahead of her. Sadly, that future dimmed during one of her morning bike rides. She would ride 17 miles out and 17 miles back. It was a very isolated area and it was very serene. It was time to herself. Tara wasn't always alone on her daily bike rides. She was often accompanied by her mother, Patty. Unfortunately, their daily mother-daughter bonding got tainted when Patty suspected a motorist of stalking her while on their rides. Patty decided to stop riding. Concerned mother also urged her daughter to do the same. When Tara brushed off her warning, she pleaded with her to at least bring a mace with her so she could defend herself. This was also disregarded by Tara, a mistake that would prove fatal. On September 20th, 1988, Tara woke up to a typical Tuesday morning around 9 a.m. A creature of organization, she first set out her clothes and books on her bed to prepare for her long day. She promised her boyfriend a couple of tennis games before her afternoon class so she figured she'd do her daily bike ride earlier. Before leaving, she jokingly told her mother to look for her if she still wasn't home by noon. Patty thought nothing of it because she knew Tara was aware of her time and would never miss her appointments. And so, Tara put on her Walkman with a Boston cassette tape blaring into her headphones and rode out on her mother's bright pink bike. Being a small town where everyone knew everyone, people saw her riding down New Mexico Road 47 it was a peaceful morning ride for Tara, who easily completed the first half of her trip. She arrived at the Southern Railroad tracks outside town, approximately 17 miles from her house. She then turned around and rode back. At around 11.30 a.m., Tara was on the road riding northbound, as seen by a couple of ranch hands along State Route 47. She rode with the wind in her hair and the sun on her skin. She had no idea it would be the last time she'd enjoy it. Fifteen minutes later, on their way home from a hunting excursion driving southbound, 
three men noticed the beautiful woman riding the pink bicycle. However, they also noticed something odd. A 1954 light-colored pickup truck with the camper attached was tailing her very closely, but Tara was unaware of it while she listened to her music. Another driver on the southbound lane saw the same thing, and even noted that the ominous truck contained multiple people inside. This was under five miles away from the Rio communities. It was the last time that Tara Lee Calico was seen. At 15 minutes past noon, Patty grew concerned. She stayed true to her word that she'd look for her daughter come noon. So the mother got in her car and drove up and down the railroad tracks along Route 47. But Tara and the pink bicycle were nowhere to be found. She even called a nearby hospital, fearing Tara had an accident and was brought in. But nobody in the hospital matched her description. You know, there wasn't the same technology that there is nowadays. There wasn't cell phones. There wasn't even pagers. It's not like Tara to do something different than what she said she's going to do. Patty contacted a few of Tara's friends, but nobody could find her. At this point, the mother's worry was astronomical. She went straight to the Valencia County Sheriff's Office and filed for a missing person report. There were many witnesses uh, that had seen Tara that day, and we thought, with all of this, somebody would come forth and be able to tell us where Tara was. The following day, on September 21st, 1988, a search party for Tara began. The police search team investigated along Route 47 four miles from the Rio communities when they came across bike tracks along the west side. It was a promising lead, and the police followed. The bike tracks veered off from the side of the road towards a shoulder with soft ground, about 100 yards away from the highway. When the police followed the trail, they were surprised to see tire tracks and a fresh oil slick. From that location, the police followed a set of footprints that led them to the most significant set of evidence for finding Tara. They have uncovered Tara's Boston cassette tape, the shards of her Walkman plastic window, and empty beer cans scattered around the secluded area. The discovery spurred the investigators to double their efforts. It was fruitless for the next few days until Saturday, September 24th, 1988 when they discovered the remaining pieces of Tara's Walkman 20 miles away from the initial location around the John F. Kennedy campground entrance near the Manzano Mountains. Due to the remoteness of the location, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office was prompted to dispatch more than 300 air and land searches throughout that very weekend. Days passed with no new evidence, so the search was called off by Tuesday, September 27, 1988. Friends and family also joined in on the search. It's unbelievable, but I kept thinking, boy, she's gonna be in trouble when she gets home, because, man, look at all this happening. But it wasn't until I went out with her friends and her boyfriend on the search, and it got real. <laughs> it was cold, it was getting dark, there was a storm coming in. Everybody was walking literally like two feet apart, hand by hand, across the both sides of the road in these empty fields driving up and down the highway, looking for any clue. During this massive search, however, Patty began to piece together a theory. She believed the remnants of Tara's cassette tape and Walkman were deliberately planted to dupe investigators to a trail that leads nowhere. In the following days and weeks, the investigation became increasingly bleak, with no new evidence gained from the several witnesses. Even a few suspects were quickly disregarded simply because they were drinking the wrong kind of beer. Lead investigator Sheriff Lawrence Romero revealed to the public that their main suspects were two males, with the driver described as 35 to 45 years old with wrinkles on the side of his eyes based on witness accounts. Weeks turned to months, and the lack of leads had dried up the investigation until an odd object was discovered that reinvigorated everything. On June 15, 1989, an unnamed woman arrived at her local convenience store in Port St. Joe, Florida more than 1,200 miles from New Mexico. She parked next to a white unmarked van before heading inside. When she returned with her groceries, the van was gone and a Polaroid was in its place on the ground. She was shocked when she saw that the photograph was of a woman and boy tied up and gagged inside a van. The woman immediately brought the Polaroid to authorities and it was broadcast across the nation. Tara's parents contacted Florida police when they saw the picture and recognized their daughter. Marty Henley also came forward when she recognized the boy as her missing son. Five months before Tara's disappearance on April 21, 1988, 
Michael Henley Jr. went on a camping trip with his father and a family friend. They had only been at the campsite for less than 20 minutes when Michael disappeared. It was immediately reported to authorities, who thoroughly searched the whole area, but Michael was never seen until his parents recognized him in that mysterious Polaroid. The most significant coincidence was that Michael had gone missing in the Zuni Mountains of New Mexico, about 75 miles from Tara Calico's home. Police approached the Polaroid Corporation for a more in-depth examination of the photo, and it was determined that the photograph was taken after May 1989, because the film it was shot on wasn't available until then. They had also noticed the book beside the woman was a paperback copy of My Sweet Adrena by V.C. Andrews, who happened to be Tara's favorite author at the time of her disappearance. Looking closer at the book showed a very promising lead. Significant thing about the book in the picture was there was a phone number inscribed on the binder of the book. And it could have been over 200 variations of a phone number. 50 of them were only valid, but they were never able to figure out what that phone number was. Since then, the authenticity of the photograph was questioned when Michael Henley Jr.'s remains were discovered in the vicinity of the Zuni Mountains in June 1990. A couple more photographs came into the spotlight, but were also debunked by authorities. The case was handed to the FBI by then, and the investigation became nationwide. Soon, the nation was in on the enigma, and expert opinions flooded in. Some pointed out the discrepancies in facial features between Tara and the woman in the Polaroid like their eyebrows, having distinctively different shapes and lines. The other side of the argument answered with the timeline theory. Since the Polaroid could only have been taken after May 1989, that meant Tara had been in captivity for at least seven months in the photograph. A lot of physical change could happen in that period, especially considering factors like weight loss, eyebrow maintenance, and the overall stress of her predicament. Both the public and the authorities examined the photograph in question. Results were varied and divided. Scotland Yard analyzed the Polaroid and concluded that it was Tara in the picture. Meanwhile, Los Alamos National Laboratory came up with an opposing conclusion. The FBI also did their assessment, but it came up inconclusive. For Tara's family, they were sure that it was her. I have pictures that look identical. I would, if I had to say yes or no, I would say yes. Yeah. I am very torn. I, I go back and forth. Do I think that's Tara? It looks exactly like her. Upon further investigation, the unnamed woman who turned in the original Polaroid remembered that the vehicle she parked beside was a white Toyota van. It had been speculated that the photograph might have been taken at that very spot with the abducted pair still inside. The woman caught a quick glimpse of the driver and stated that it was a middle-aged, mustached man probably in his late 30s. Even though speculations pointed out that this was the man who abducted Tara and that she was in that van, there were still some who pointed out that it could all be just a sick prank. Despite this, Patty insisted that the woman in the photograph had the same scar as Tara. Years earlier, Tara was in a car accident and battled with a leg injury that left her with a scar similar to that in the photo. For the investigators, this was still inconclusive. In September of 2008, 20 years after Tara's disappearance, the sheriff of Ventura County, Rene Rivera, came out with a statement that he knew who abducted and ended Tara's life. Rivera said that he had received information over the years that two men, who were teenagers at the time of Tara's disappearance, found her riding her bike on the rural road that day and had helped in disposing of her body afterward. According to Rivera, the two men were taunting Tara in the back of a pickup truck they hit her bike, which caused her to fall. Then they abducted her and ended her life in panic when she threatened to contact the police. Fortunately, without any concrete evidence, like a buried body, he couldn't make an arrest or act on those tips. Rivera also refused to release the alleged suspect's names, but it matched a recorded statement made by Henry Brown, a New Mexico resident. In Brown's statement, he shared how he used to hang out with fellow Valencia County teenagers, led by troublemaker Lawrence Romero Jr., who was the son of the old sheriff. He confessed that Romero Jr. was interested in Tara, but was rejected because she was dating someone else. He also went on to say that Romero Jr. and his friends hit Tara with their truck, violated her, ended her life, and then disposed of the body at a nearby pond. As fate would have it, further investigation into Lawrence Romero Jr. and his friends met a dead end because they had all died. Lawrence Jr. ended his own life with a gun, 
and his last note before he died, which allegedly contained a confession, was nowhere to be found. Still, it remained among the countless theories surrounding Tara's case, which circulated newsstands. Rumors of people spotting Tara in Florida had been going around, along with theories that she was taken by a serial kidnapper who liked throwing off authorities with Polaroids and breadcrumbs leading to dead ends. There were also multiple photographs discovered with victims' mouths blacked out with marker ink. Authorities speculated if these were somehow involved in Tara's case, but this was eventually dismissed. There was even a psychic who called the Port St. Joe Police Department. She claimed that she had seen Tara's death in her dreams and told the officers that her body was buried in California. She also mentioned a lady she met at a club who introduced herself as Tara Calico. This wild tangent in the investigation yielded zero results and the case went cold once again. After some time, even the rumors and theories died down, and Tara's case remained a mystery. Authorities assigned a task force of six federal and local agents to the case in 2013, hoping to reinvigorate the investigation, but it still came up empty. Authorities of the Valencia County Sheriff's Office passed on the cold case of Tara Calico to Lieutenant Joseph Rowland in October 2016. He had been working on it tirelessly, and had been in frequent contact with Tara's sister, Michelle. I believe some sort of foul play took place uh, that day, September 20th, 1988, and Tara was taken or abducted or murdered or something. Michelle was not ready to give up hope for her sister, so she teamed up with Melinda Esquibel, Tara's friend, and they started an investigative podcast with episodes diving deep into the investigations of her disappearance. I just burst into tears because it all came back. It's just stuck with me that after all this time, they didn't know what had happened. Unfortunately, Tara's mother, Patty Dole, wouldn't see the day that justice was served for her daughter. Patty died in 2006 due to complications of a series of strokes after relocating to Florida with her husband. According to her friends and family, Tara was always on her mind until the very end. There were times when she'd point to a girl on a bicycle and ask if that was Tara, and her husband would somberly respond to her, No, that's not Tara. Tara's parents always reserved a room just for her in the house and left her gifts with every Christmas and birthday that came and went. Chris Dole, Tara's older brother, noted that her disappearance had taken a toll on his mother and had significantly shortened her life. She firmly believed that Tara was that woman in the Polaroid. Michelle and Melinda kept the case of Tara alive with their podcast firmly believed there had been a cover-up by Valencia law enforcement from that time. Despite the skepticism, they remained steadfast and strong on their theories and continually worked with current law enforcement in the investigation. I believe that the family of the individuals that did this were involved in the cover-up, and I believe that they know where Tara's remains are or where they were. And there's talk in the community that everybody knows what's happened to Tara Calico. I believe there's people out there that know exactly what happened. I believe those people need to come forward and trust us to act appropriately on that. The sad and frustrating part of Tara's case was that if the real culprits of the crime were ever revealed, the law couldn't provide justice for her friends and family, the same people who never gave up hope of finding the truth. Any crime that had occurred to Tara Calico on September 20th, 1988, the vast majority of those crimes that could have been committed, the statute of limitations has long since been expired. Despite this significant setback in the statute of limitations, Tara's remaining family and friends stood solid and unwavering. Melinda Esquibel will never forget the kindness Tara had shown her on that day when she joined the marching band. She continually kept this memory in her heart to fuel her resolve on the podcast with Michelle Dole. They will never stop until they find Tara Lee Calico and shed light on what happened to her during her last bike ride. I guess the one thing that I'd like for people to know is it's never gonna be over until it's over. So if anybody thinks that this is gonna go away and it's going to be swept under the rug again, it's not. I'm gonna continue with this, this is not going away. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.